I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Did that work? No. Was Pilate free from his uh, involvement in this? No. Isn't it amazing that uh, 2,000 years later, the name Pontius Pilate in Protestant churches isn't held in the high esteem? Neither is Judas. He was a what? Exactly. And on his and on the scribes and the Pharisees' power. That's correct. So Pilate washes his hands and he takes the same words that his wife said in the letter have nothing to do with this just. Right? And he says it to the people. And then he looks at the scribes and the Pharisees and says, You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us. Why would you say that? Why would you curse yourself and your children? Let me ask you a question. Did it come true? Yes. Yes. Be careful yes. what comes out your mouth. Amen. Because you never know what the outcome is going to be. You think they regretted this um, as time went on? Yes. His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Delivered him to who? What did the law state? Could the Jews put anybody to crucifixion? No. no. So when Pilate said to the Jews, you take care of it, could they take care of it? No. No. It still had to be done by the Romans. Pilate was just washing his hands. You ever wonder how he got that? term, that lexicon, in our lexicon, excuse me, and that's where it comes from. I wash my hands of it, yeah. understand? If you look at American language, you will find so many terms in our lexicon that comes from Scripture. Okay, so, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him, and they mocked him, saying, what? Have you ever seen what this crown of thorns looked like? Ever seen how big these thorns were? What did they do with the reed when they took it out of his hands? They hit, it on, they hit it on the head. They hit him on this crown of thorns. Let me ask you a question. Before any of this took place, and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane during the night, and he said to his disciples, Stay awake and pray with me. My soul is sorrowful even unto what? Death. Was Jesus exaggerating? You know how children exaggerate? When, when they feel bad or they hurt or, or you met people, some of them are hypochondriacs, they exaggerate. Was Jesus exaggerating here? No. Do you understand when he said his soul was sorrowful even unto death, he meant that. That this depression that came over him could have snuffed out his earthly life. Because if it doesn't mean that, then it means he was exaggerating. Right? What caused his soul to be sorrowful even unto death? You know it. Say it. He was taking the penalty of sin upon him. He who knew no sin became sin. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus have a human nature? Yes. And did he have a divine nature? Yes. Was it stuck in the same body? Yes. What happens when sin enters the presence of the divine? Doesn't it become a consuming fire? Amen. You ever wonder why Jesus didn't just burn up from the inside? Am I the one that ever thinks of these things? <laughs> Apparently. Can you imagine the 
this battle that's going on inside him as he's taking on the sin of the world and he still has a divine nature? A non-dark, non-sinful, that uh, the divine is pure, it is holy, it is just, and he became sin? And you wonder why he said he was sorrowful even unto death? Have you guys ever been through inner turmoil, <coughs> struggling with decisions to make, hard decisions, tough decisions? They may not even be decisions, maybe you're dealing with situations that have taken place in your life, and you're trying to figure out why, what am I supposed to do? And you know that turmoil, inner turmoil can be some of the hardest battles you'll ever fight. Hold on Gary. What would it be like to have a divine nature and then become sin? And in that divine nature, know your father and realize there has never from eternity past to the present ever been a separation. You have always been one. When Jesus took on humanity, was he still one with his father? Yes. He said, I am my father, are one. If you have seen me, you've seen and yet when he took on sin, what did the Father do? What did the Spirit do that lived inside of Jesus in his humanity? It withdrew. You guys understand that? This is why Jesus died the second death. Gary? Well, the Bible says it was such an agonizing situation, he was literally sweating drops of blood. You guys know how that happens? There is a Can you do that? Can you sweat blood? Say it out. From the capillaries, it actually comes out. The yeah, there's a medical reality. Your capillaries burst right out of the skin, <coughs> and blood will come out. If you cage a rhinoceros and you cage him too long, and he gets so freaked out in that cage, he will sweat blood. Did you guys know that? Did Jesus sweat blood because he was worried about them driving nails through his hands and feet? No. Was he the first one ever to be crucified? No. That was their form of uh, execution. They hung hundreds of men on the walls going into Jerusalem. The Romans did as payback for insurrection at one time. It wasn't the crucifixion. It wasn't the crown of thorns. It was that the just would become unjust. The sinless would take on sin so that you and I could call him our Savior. Amen. Amen. And brothers and sisters, we sit here today and some of us, that actually makes no change in how we think or live or act in our lives. If that doesn't affect your heart, what difference are you than the scribes and the Pharisees who called out for his death? Dude, can I have ten more minutes? I'm not going to be here for a month. I've got to get a month's worth of speech. And they spat on him, this is verse 30, and they took a reed and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put on his own clothes, and they led him away to be, what? Crucified. And now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Why did he not drink this stuff, but right before he died, and he said, I'm a thirst, you find this in other Gospels. And they gave him vinegar to drink. He drank that. That's why he didn't take it. He didn't take the stuff with gall. Why did they give these guys gall mixed in with vinegar? Okay, it was to ease the pain that was in being compassionate. Okay, we're going to kill you in the most horrible way ever. Do you know the word crucifixion? That is where we get our word excruciating from. Okay, so they gave them gall mixed with wine. He didn't take that. Why? 
Those of you who question our health message, understand this precept that is given right here. He wanted nothing to cloud his mind to allow him to go through this process. Whatever pain that was going to come, he was going to accept it, and he was going to accept it with a clean, clear mind because he needed that to see it through the end. And I'm about to get to that. That is one of those texts, like I said, that caused me to question for a long period of time. Why would he say this? So, verse 35, then they crucified him and they did what? Do you remember what Lester read in Psalm 22? What did they do? They divided his garments and they cast lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots. Now, sitting down, they kept watch over him, and they put up over his head the accusation written that said, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the left, one on the right. And those who passed by did what? What does it say after that? Wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Remember what it said in Psalm 22? Go to the other Gospels and see what the people were saying to him. And they used the exact same words that David wrote a thousand years before it happened. Amen. Now let me ask you a question. If Jesus came down from the cross, like they said, do you think they would have believed on him then? No. no. Ricky, you look like you're trying to think, well, maybe. No, oh no. no it, it, it would be all, over for all of us. If he would have came down, they wouldn't have believed him. They would have said, how are we going to get rid of this guy? What do we do now? Who was it? that planned his death? The people or the Father? A thousand years before this happened, the Holy Spirit gave David utterance what was going to take place on this day. Whose plan was this? Pilots, <coughs> the scribes and the Pharisees, or God himself? the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. How many Gospels do you find the one thief turning to Jesus and saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? One. In that Gospel, does it say both of them railed against Jesus or just the one? Both this of them. Is both of them. That Gospel, so, so like I said, this is why you have four accounts. And this is why it's important that you take all four accounts. Because we're going to read what this account says. <clears throat> Even the robbers, that word robbers is what? Singular or plural? So that's both of them. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. And that's all in Matthew Gospel that says about those guys. Okay? This is why you got to take these accounts and read them from all four Gospels. And it gives you a much clearer total picture. <laughs> now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, what? There you go. I don't have to read that. That's good. That is to say, 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The scribes heard it and they said he calls who? Elijah. Elijah. And what did they say? Let Elijah come down and save him. These guys were cruel. They were murderers. They were under the control of Satan himself. Now let me ask you a question. If David wrote this Psalm 22 a thousand years before this time, don't you think Satan would have realized what was going on this time? Do you think it would have been not in his interest to have him actually die on the cross? He tried to get him not to. Because in the wilderness, what did he want him to do? He wanted him to make the stones into bread. If he was the Son of God. If Meaning, doubt yourself, show this to me, I am going to be over with. Show them all the kingdoms of the world. Actually, took him to the high mountain, he's going to throw them over. Jump! The angels will bear you up so you don't dash your foot against the rock. Amen. Presumption, right? Do that, I am going to be over. What plan? The plan of going to the cross. Did Lucifer know what was going on? Yes. And did he come down to the end? You wonder what the heck? Is going on. What did you say? He can't help himself. Say that loud so everybody can hear you. He can't help himself. That is the answer to this question. The devil cannot help himself. There are events that are played out here. Everybody had their choices to make, and the choices were made. The die was cast, and nothing would stop this moving forward. Yes? But point out that God did not kill Jesus, God withdrew from Jesus. And Satan took over. And he, God knew exactly what Satan was going to do. God did not kill Jesus. Jesus laid down his life. What do you guys think about that? I don't agree with that. Jesus laid down his life because okay. God's law says, Thou shalt not kill. No, God's law says, Thou shalt not murder. murder, and murder. Why is God justified in killing the sinner? Because they broke the law. He was lost for <laughs> No, 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 no. Let, let, let me ask you a question. Here's something to think about, because this is an age-old uh, 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 question. When God sent the flood, and He destroyed all life, it says for Noah and his children and their wives, did they withdraw from God and they just kind of like jumped in the lake? Or did God send a flood and wipe everybody out? God sent the flood and wiped everybody out. Who was responsible for all their deaths? God. God. Well, God withdrew from them because he offered them the choice to go into the ark. Withdrawing from them. Who was the one to set the flood? And in the end days, when this earth is purified by fire, who sends that fire? In the end, you got to understand this. Either God is sovereign or God is not. This is the argument that predestinarians will use for you guys. That is, God is in charge of everything. And God takes responsibility for, ultimately, in the end, everything. This is why there's text in the Old Testament that says God sends evil. Okay? And, and it's like, well, that's a hard one to swallow. But in the end, who was the ultimate one responsible for Job's trials? God. That's right. It wasn't Satan. It was God. Because who has more power, God or the devil? God allowed it. God allowed it in the end. If I allow you to get run over by a car, no, if I allow my friend to break into your house and kill you, am I going to be in just as much trouble as he is? Because I did nothing to say. So think about this. John, yes. John 10, 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down with my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Now stop right there. Who gave Jesus this authority? The Father. This was God's plan from the beginning to save man from sin. Jesus took on sin. You guys understand what that meant? He became sin. It was who he was. So because he became sin, God poured out all his wrath on him. That wrath meant he had to die. God killed him. Let me ask you a question. 
I break into Marilyn's house and I shoot both Marilyn and Bob. I kill them. I murder them. And I did it premeditatively. I get caught. I go to court. I am judged to be guilty. And the jury says I should get the death penalty. Who is it ultimately that makes the decision whether I get the death penalty or not? Which one? The judge or the jury? The judge. And at the end of the day, who is the main one responsible for me being sentenced to death? It is that judge because he signed that paper. It's the same thing with God. When God destroys the wicked, he destroys the wicked. Jesus became sin who knew no sin. He suffered that second death, and it was God that punished him. Can you imagine? This is why God loves you so much. You deserve that. I deserve that, but he gave it to his son. How can you have three co-eternal beings that were always one and have this separation? One becoming what he never was supposed to be. You can't even fathom what sin is, and he becomes sin. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yes. So he cries out with this loud voice. The doctor is white. I kept asking this question. Why did he cry out what David wrote so many years before? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was he experiencing at that time? All the sins of the world. What happened when he saw the divinity of God looking upon him? He felt condemnation. Why do you think Paul writes in the book of Romans, chapter 8, after that great, that great chapter 7, what does chapter 8, verse 1 say? No condemnation. Why is there for now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Because Jesus took all of that condemnation. And it was total and complete. There is no more for us because he who knew no sin became sin. Amen. God himself in the flesh took your sin so that you would never have to face it again. Amen. Man, I've got about an hour to go. But listen, our closing hymn this morning is going to be hymn number 152. <laughs>